Just, you can start the episode. Welcome to the beautiful Kibbe on Liberty Christmas episode, <laughs> where we feature the fabulous Free the People team <laughs> in all of their glory. Mm-hmm. It's quite possible we were up late last night celebrating christmas stuff. Some mm-hmm. of us much later than others. Yep. Yeah. I, Some of us, not n- mentioning any names, Matt, did the classic Irish exit. I love the Irish exit he's because... He's a professional at it. Yeah. I mean, no, it's... People didn't even know I was there in the first place. I'm that good at it. But I, th- I thought this year, like we did this last year, and it was it was kind of a beautiful shit show. But uh, I was hoping to be more focused this year and just talk about um, projects that each of you have led at Free the People this year, which which are really just uh, conversations that we thought were the most important issues, the most important projects we could have worked on. And uh, why, don't, why don't I start with you, Logan, because we, we, we just finished, uh, well, we're not finished, but we, we've been reviewing and arguing about the final-ish cut of, of your latest project. Yes. Well, as you know, I am a relentless optimist, and it's been difficult these last couple of years to be an optimist because things have been really terrible. But I've been desperately searching for a silver lining. And one of the things that I noticed was happening was People, the government school system has failed parents so badly, so catastrophically badly throughout the whole COVID situation that a lot of them are starting to wake up and realize how flawed that system really is. And so I wanted to do some kind of a, a documentary highlighting people's decision to remove their children from the government school system because of COVID or because of other pre-existing failures of the school system. And uh, we found a bunch of really interesting mothers and families with kids, and they have decided that they want to take their kids out of school and teach them at home themselves. And we're telling their story about the horrible things they were forced to endure doing like Zoom schooling and all the COVID protocols in the classroom and not being able to communicate with teachers and just having no help or guidance from the system whatsoever and to a place where they are taking charge of their children's education and they're spending a lot more time with them and they're a lot happier. And so it's a really nice, moving, inspirational story that sort of shows a silver lining of COVID that we're exposing the cracks in some of these failed systems that have been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing I like about it is uh, one of the biggest challenges we have when we when we think theoretically about a potentially different way of doing things is it's always sort of this theory about how um, a marketplace for education would actually work. But in this practical example, they're, they're actually doing it, and it's working, and they already have results. They see um, particularly some of the kids um, that, that are discussed were struggling under lockdowns and in very tangible ways and it just got better when they got them out of that that horrible system yeah you remove the coercion and you kind of let let them pursue their interest in a more organic fashion and it does wonders i mean i was a lifelong unschooler and my sister was as well and so it's a personal issue for me because i think it's I think the school system does a lot of harm to children and by kind of forcing them to fit in this box and you're going to learn the same thing as everybody else your age at the same time, even though your mind is developing at a different rate and you're going to sit in the classroom without windows all day and stare at a screen or stare at a blackboard. And I just don't think it's a natural way for people to learn. I mean, it's not how children explore the world and pursue it. And so I always get really happy when I see people questioning that model and trying something different. I feel like it's, um, like you said, it's, we have to thank the, almost thank the pandemic for, this silver lining that's happened, you know, because it made it so clear what was happening in yeah. government mm-hmm. schools. I mean, when you actually have see pictures or video of, of kids with masks over their faces, you know, all mm-hmm. sitting in the desk, it just has a different feel, kind of an eerie feel about it. So I'm, I'm just I'm kind of excited. I'm not I was an unschooled, but I was homeschooled for most of my life. I was in a homeschool cooperative. And I love that now there's this huge movement away from schools and People are innovating. They're creating new types of schools, which is well, great. And one of the things that I was hoping that maybe you guys could highlight a little bit was we interviewed uh, six different I – mean, it was six to parent, but the paradigms for all of them were different. No one yeah. was doing necessarily the exact same thing. Um, could, could you maybe, like, talk a little bit about some of the variations that we saw? Because I thought that was very interesting mm-hmm. as someone who wasn't homeschooled. Yeah, so – it's cool because the, the people we found to interview all have a slightly different approach to it. Some of them are a little bit more structured. Some of them are less structured. Some of them work. Um, I was really glad we found some working parents mm-hmm. because the thing I always hear from people is I can't teach my kid because I work. And here's several people doing it and making it work. 
So that's pretty interesting. And uh, some of them go to this like group co-op with a bunch of other children where they can get some socialization in and get some play in and uh, learn as a group. And some of them are more a little bit more solitary, but it just depends on what works for the kid. And the, the whole theory behind it is that you know everyone's different and everyone learns in a different way. And so trying to make everybody learn the same way doesn't really work so well. Mm-hmm. But also coming up with um, innovative ways to solve a substantial problem for parents, particularly parents at work. And I think I think one of the mythologies of, of homeschooling, leaving the government school system, is that it would be such an overwhelming responsibility for any parent to pull off on their own. But of course, that's not exactly how it happens. Some people do that, but but this um, this you know co-ops and pods and any sort of thing that sort of um, spreads the responsibility and the burden amongst various parents and maybe they bring in a professional teacher. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, um, and I've talked to parents that do this, um, they've actually calculated how much would it cost to actually hire a teacher to run our pod full time. Mm -hmm. And it it quite quickly becomes affordable if you can find a way to, to share the burden. Definitely, there's a lot of that sharing the burden going on. And one of the things we heard from everybody over and over again is like how much faster they're able to do the same amount of work at home because you're not held back to someone else's schedule you can be on your own schedule and so it's not as much of a time commitment as people think it is because you can accomplish in an hour what the school will take a week to do basically because you're forced to move everybody along at the same rate whereas you know if you're getting something quickly you can move on from it or if you're a little slower on it you can take your time on it Mm -hmm. but uh yeah people seem to find that they have a lot more time than they think they're going to initially you know sam you're the the the, the editor and the director of photography. I don't, I don't know what all titles you have for this, but you, you're intimately involved That's, in this yeah, project. Yeah, a couple of them. And, <laughs> Not um, director, director of photography. Okay. Yeah. It, I, I mean, we make up titles here all the time. True. Um, <laughs> so you're the pre- El Presidente of this project. Um, the, the, the thing you were referencing earlier, I think is pretty striking because when, when I saw the footage of the kids in masks and double masks lined up, to, to get uh, uh, their temperatures taken, I think is what mm-hmm. it is. It reminds me of uh, the movie The Wall. I don't know if you get this reference, mm-hmm. but um, The Wall was it was treating kids like cogs mm-hmm. in a machine, and they're all marching mindlessly forward. And I, I think um, at its worst, particularly under lockdowns, um, you know, these schools can be prisons for kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's my thought. <laughs> Good thought. It wasn't a question, Sam. No. <laughs> I, I was I waiting for some I, question I, I, mark That's there. such a libertarian thing. I have a question, and then you give like this 10-minute long dissertation. I, and I you might change the inflection at the end of the sentence to make it pretend to be a question, but it's still just a sentence. They were so going it, into a meat grinder, by the way. It, yeah, it yeah. reminds me of The Wall. <laughs> Yes, it does remind you of that. Yeah, but the movie, the movie that that the, what he's what he's trying to say, Sam, I think yeah. I'm picking up on it is you know how we were, we're we're talking about how we're still editing and debating the final cut is mm-hmm. that Sam's cut wasn't quite Wally enough yet for Kibby. That's what he's trying to say. He's not it depressed enough when he walks enough. out of the movie. Yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, I you know I just feel like we've you know we've produced enough depressed stuff. You know, yeah. like yeah. we do a lot of stuff that's pretty depressing. So that's true. every once in a while we have these feel good documentaries and. I feel like that was kind of an accomplishment to make a feel-good documentary during this pandemic, right? Because yeah, I certainly was. We may also that. made one that was de- very depressing. Yeah, which you want to talk about that? We can now? we can yeah. transition. Is that, segue? Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that a question? Is it, <laughs> well, that was a moving. I made the sad one. I yeah. made yeah. the sad one. Yeah, it's yeah. super yeah. sad. It I it, it doesn't get better. <laughs> So we did. Um, we made a documentary called "All We Have" about a restaurant bar, family-owned bar in Brooklyn called the Schnitzel House, and um, it was about a. You know, I thought, and I, I think that that, and, and this ties into the education doc sick year as well, where I, I think that for one of the most important things that we'll be doing for probably the rest of our lives is documenting, and commenting on, and grappling with the effects of the decisions that were made in 2020 and that have kind of continued piling on top one of a, one one after the other um so it's really i think all of this work is really important and whether p- 
people watch it now or watch it five years from now or ten years from now, I think it's going to be relevant in some really awful ways. And, uh, and, and, and you know, they, I'll tell a little bit of the story. I will. I'm getting to it. Oh, Hold sorry. on. I'm, I'm leading up to it. Just give me a minute. Jeez. What's your point, dude? My point is, <laughs> is so. Is a question? Yes. My point is, is that the, the, impo- the, the, the reason why we produce the films that we produce this year, so sick year, all we have. Um, is because we're trying to capture what's happened. And so all we have was about the effects that the lockdowns and restrictions and mandates have had on the restaurant industry. Now, by proxy, it also shows the effect that it's had on the health industry because their son, who um, the, who had, was, had started having seizures in 2019, had, you know, was supposed to have appointments to figure, to start getting this looked at in 2020. And because of COVID and regulations and lockdowns they they pushed those appointments back and he ended up having a grand mal seizure and and passing away in 2020 so being able to tell um the urban family story uh i think is really important and i think it shines a light on what's probably been happening to almost every family-owned restaurant or business in in the country and so um you know, you don't need. We don't need to go document every single restaurant, but just showing one is a is a perfect way to be like, this is what's going on, and we shouldn't forget that what's what's happened, because so they're not going to get their life back. So it, it's kind of a, a damning condemnation of all of the arrogant policies of Andrew Cuomo mm-hmm. and De Blasio in New York City, but those guys are never mentioned by name, and it's no. it, there's not a political bone in this movie. It's just about the human costs of political arrogance yeah and i think it's important with the especially with these documentaries that we produce when we're we're using you know when we're going in into a person's home like we were with sick year or um you know going into their business is that you want to represent the truth and not i you know i don't want you know all we have wasn't meant to be make a political statement it was just supposed to say this is what happened Right. I mean, it was a very personal, intimate story about what happened to this this family. I mean, I've talked about this at a number of different conferences, and it's actually it's really hard still to this day for me not to tear up when I'm talking about it on stage, which yeah. can be kind of um, embarrassing. But it's it's a it's a beautiful story, and like you said, it's not political, and and we've won so many awards for mm-hmm. it, and not just in our our libertarian space, but what I think is so special is that we we've, we've been recognized in winning awards. In, in New York City film festivals. I mean, we yeah. won Best COVID Film, and it was what, the New York Television? Yeah, New York they, film they all, they all, have, film they all have the same name. Like, all the festivals in right. New York are all New York... Something. Something festival. Right. And so then, <laughs> and then just last month, it was shown as part of the New York City Short Shorts International. International Film Festival. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's really cool. And next week, um, we'll all be down in Miami, and, and we're a finalist um, for the Lights, Camera, Liberty um, festival down there. Mm-hmm. Although I guess by the time this airs, we'll know if we were winners or losers. Let's just but. call ourselves winners. Yeah, right, we're winners. We're winners. We so, win. um, well, and and it was cool seeing it in a movie. We went, you know, it, it, uh, the one festival they had it in person in New York, and so we went and they showed it in a movie theater, and that was that was cool. I mean, um, and we got to see it when we when it screened at uh, Anthem at Freedom Fest over the summer, that was in a really cool movie theater as well. And that was the first time that I think we'd seen any of our films on a movie theater, yeah. which is cool. And, and I will say, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we, we, we do these films and we produce them and, and we generally are just looking at them on our, on our computers. Mm-hmm. And um, the first time that Matt and I saw, I guess it was... How to Love we, Your Enemy. How to Love Your Enemy um, at Lights, Camera, Liberty Festival or, or training session this past summer. And we saw it on a big screen and we were both like, Holy shit, that looks really good on a, yeah. a big mm-hmm. screen. We were like kind of blown away. I guess I shouldn't say such nice things about your work. But well, I was gonna, I was going to say it transforms the experience. Though it it, <laughs> it definitely, but it definitely transforms the experience. Right. I mean, there right. there are there, um, it made it. I, I thought that because I hate you know I I don't like things after I'm done with them, and so I was shocked when I watched all we have it at anthem and i was like oh wow i like this actually like i i've watched it a billion times editing it um and i it it it, it hit me differently watching it you know on a on a movie theater Hmm. but it kind of like um and and i'm the guy that terry picks on for quoting dead economists and and but i will do it anyway because i'm allowed um 
but but the whole point of free the people is to try to translate um, complex ideas and libertarian values into into a, an emotionally compelling story. And to me, as the dork economist, I, I see Bastiat's uh, story of the seen and unseen. And we've been struggling since the beginning of the pandemic to deal with this this supposed trade-off between health and wealth. And we're, we're all accused because we say things like, if you shut down the economy, you're going to hurt people. The retort has been, well, you just care about money, not not people. And of course, this film captures the human costs of the lockdowns mm-hmm. in a way that all the data about excess cancer deaths and all that stuff, like people don't care about data, but but they, they care about that family and they care about that son. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, I, I don't know. I, I, that's why I said, that's why I say though, like, that, like, I think that so much of our work for the next forever is going to be still dealing with the ramifications of last year. I don't know how any creative person can create anything after what's gone on and not be thinking or commenting on what, on it. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's shocking that it's not, it, it's shocking to me that, that there aren't, that you know that there are, that there isn't this large creative movement around this yet i'm i'm kind of i'm very surprised i think it's happening i mean there's been obviously such um monolithically imposed group speak on any conversation about covid or vaccines or what you're allowed to say what you're not allowed mm-hmm. to say but i i see um you know logan described a counter revolution in education where parents just have enough and they're like, okay, I got to do something. I'm, I'm finally, not only am I seeing the, the horrible way that they teach my children, but I'm seeing the curriculum that they're teaching them. Um, I see a counter revolution, people realizing the human costs and in, in not just in terms of lost businesses, but lost lives. And, and the third piece of it, which is what you've really focused on this year, Sam is, is sort of the, the group think part of it. Mm-hmm. And, and the idea that that we would give up our civil liberties, including the right to speak our minds, yeah. um, for some supposed top-down imposed greater good. Right. Talk talk about some of those projects. See, there's sure. a there's a question at that's the end good, of that. That's a, such a good question. Well, um, talk about some of those projects. <laughs> that's not a question either. Is <laughs> it? <laughs> that was a directive. The so so, so yeah, why was... why did why did you do these projects <laughs> and what were they? Um, yeah. Well, uh, I did a series called uh, Freedom Over Fear, which I worked on with with Logan over here, and uh, Cult of Wokeness. And we started this at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, I think for me, it was just, and for all of us, it was really clear early on that this this wasn't going to be good, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the series, more than anything, is just a warning about lots of different issues, um, about how the government can take away rights um, in a state of emergency. And then we go back in history and we look at examples in history of how they've done that in the past. Um, the most recent one I did was uh, called Submission, Not Safety, because uh, I really wanted to dig into, I mean, something that libertarians talk about a lot, but I don't think normal people really understand that these rules, these mandates um, haven't made any sense. Like, they haven't worked, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so I, I dig into it and I look at, you know, if this was about safety, if, if this was about health, why aren't we talking about natural immunity? Why aren't we talking about um, natural ways to boost your immune system so your body can actually handle a virus like this? Why aren't we talking about the obesity epidemic in this country right now? You know, it's just, uh, and, and I noticed this from the beginning because I'm, I'm into natural medicine. Um, I'm into using as few pharmaceutical drugs as possible. Um, but it, it's, this entire time, it's been very clear that the policies have been pushing people toward the end goal of the vaccine and that's it and that is the only way out of this pandemic is the vaccine and we can't talk about any other uh forms of treatment because that would distract from this vaccine which by the way doesn't work that well (laughs) um and nobody's really talking about that and then i mean you just got this video killed on youtube yeah way to go you don't suppose I'm surprised it hasn't been killed already, honestly. Um, you don't suppose that the reason that, that the government is really forcing people into getting vaccinated is that they've in, 
actually own parts of Moderna and some of the other pharmaceuticals. No, They've invested so much now, money. Now we're, now we're totally oh canceled. <laughs> Come on, like, guys. That is Misinformation. Right? If you guys yeah. keep it up, we're actually going to get disappeared. Stop yeah. following the money trail. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, yes, uh, obviously. Um, yeah, the, uh, it, it's just so clear that this whole, this whole thing has been about control. I mean, when you look at... Um, you look at states like California versus Florida. They've had vastly different policies and no discernible difference whatsoever in case rates or deaths or any of this. In fact, I think Florida is one of the lowest, isn't it, lowest deaths in the country right now? And and given the average age mm -hmm. of Florida, mm -hmm. right? right? I mean, everyone moves there to retire. One of the jokes is it's it's heaven's waiting room, right? Mm -hmm. Like you would think that the death rate there would be so much higher because they do have so right. many, you know, elderly. Because people and do people. move there to die. They do move there to die. And golf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, golf is like waiting to die. <laughs> You know, one of the one of the bizarre things about the lockdowns was these, and this this kind of gets into the cult of wokeness stuff as well. You weren't allowed to talk about obesity. Somehow, mm -hmm. obesity was equated with with bigotry or or racism. Right. And and we we had done earlier work, and you actually started in a video we did two or three years ago, looking at the government food pyramid mm -hmm. and how it taught people all the wrong lessons about diet right and and the government is 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 very much culpable in making people overweight so they did that and then they locked us down and they banned us from going to the gym and for for weeks and months in certain places you weren't allowed to go outside and walk yeah deprived you of vitamin d all the mm -hmm. things that actually would help yeah and mm -hmm. i've seen i've seen data that that i, I forget the what the number is, but people got a lot fatter, yeah, shockingly, totally. being locked in their houses. I can say personally for myself, <laughs> I gained a few pounds. <laughs> yeah, just this panel alone uh, looks hey. good. Except yeah. for Terry. Terry. Terry looks great. Careful, Kibby. Yeah. Let's go off script a little bit. Let's talk about these insane parties you throw where in a real world, you would get a keg of beer, you'd put a tap in it, You'd put a couple bags of chips out, and you'd invite your friends over, and it'd be fun. It wouldn't be that much work. Mm -hmm. But that's not how you roll. This isn't Wayne's world, and it's not Kibby's world either. <laughs> so what? Six Christmas trees. Six Christmas trees, three hams, two casseroles of macaroni and cheese. And one, a partridge in a pear tree. A partridge in uh -huh. a pear tree. One large casserole of classic green bean casserole. Lots of wine. Whiskey. A lot of cases of beer. A lot of cases of beer. Thanks Flying to dog. our friend Jim Caruso at Flying Dog. He graciously donated the, the beer for the party. Everyone had a great time. Everyone that came talked about, like, it's the Christmas party to come to. We had people from all over the world come. We had folks from Indonesia and Iceland and Germany and we literally had, Maryland. We had Vikings we cross had Vikings the Atlantic. Who And one of the Vikings And invade actually, our home. He tried to smuggle whale meat in from Iceland for us, but got busted. Oh. <laughs> but, but we were given a bottle of, of uh, some whiskey-type beverage. Icelandic whiskey smoked with sheep dung? Yeah. Wow. That that's sounds a... delicious. <laughs> so we'll try that. We'll try that. Maybe that's how we should end oh, the show. Yeah. Where is it? <laughs> It's in the it's uh in the it's in the liquor closet. Yeah. So you you want to you want to do this on on camera? No. no. <laughs> Hair of the dog. I'm um. But okay, it is a lot of work. But people come; they have a lot of fun. It we work our asses off. These guys worked really hard yesterday helping us. We put together um, that fire. That you stick. put together. It it turned freezing cold last night. We challenged our our guys' um, mechanical sides and. They put together a space heater for the backyard patio, and everyone was happy about it. No one froze to death. So you're, you're saying you're not going to stop doing this? No, and if you keep picking on me, I'm just going to double down. <laughs> you can't stop it. It's a tradition. <laughs> so, so Terry. So Matt. What did you do this year that was interesting? What did I do this year that was, besides planning like an amazing party? Yeah. Um, so we started a really cool project that I'm very excited about called Ciudad de la Libertad. And when we're finished with this project, I'm going to make sure that I can pronounce that absolutely correctly with the proper Spanish Accent. It was pretty good. I'm getting better. It's pretty good. Um, and so what we're doing is um, we're going to look at Miami as the city of liberty and, and focus on immigrants that have come there from, from all over Latin America. I mean, people are coming here searching for their versions of freedom and liberty. Like people think that Miami, um, it's, it's all Cuban people that come there and, and they are all, you know, fleeing Castro and, and that's why they come. But 
people are coming there from Honduras and Venezuela and, and Mexico and Guatemala, and they're all coming for various uh, different reasons. And we're starting to source our subjects for it. And we have the first shoot scheduled for, for next week with this amazing artist named Carlos Luna. Um, Car carlosluna.com if you want to learn more about his story or wait for the film to, mm -hmm. to come out. Um, so he was an artist. He started drawing and painting at a very young age and he left because he said, I would not be able to produce my art if, if I stayed in Cuba. I have to leave. And if anyone that, that studies socialism and, and communism, they go after the artists first because those are the people that affect popular culture. And so they are the most dangerous. So we were introduced to Carlos. Matt and I spent a, a day with him in his studio in Miami. His art is amazing. He's, his story is great. He fled Venezuela, he, or Cuba, Cuba, sorry. He fled Cuba, went to Mexico, lived in Mexico for 20, 10 years, mm -hmm. 10 years. Met his wife there and they, they came here on a, a special visa that allows artists and, and um, people with very special abilities to come. He has this great studio. His art is shown in, in um, art festivals and, and exhibits all over the world. And it's a very, very awesome style. I don't even know how you pronounce it. I'm not even sure I've even seen anything close to his style. You're the artist. Is there anything I mean, similar? like, he... he, he uh, a lot, all of his paintings have a lot... He, he has this whole icono iconography that he works throughout right. his paintings. Which I think is really cool, and it's in it, and there is a there's a language in there, and there is also literal language on many of the paintings, and so um, one of the thing that's things that I think is really interesting about his work is that the more that you know about him, the more that you know about where he's from and the you know his upbringing, the culture, the more that his paintings start to mean. Right. Um, so there's a lot of sim symbols going on, and, and one of the things that we're hoping to do with our profile of him and, 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 and in this film is to, you know, work, talk about, you know, what happened in Cuba, why he had to leave, and, and um, use his paintings to do that. Right. Because that's, I mean, that's how he's, he's chosen to, right. to deal with these, these Yeah, and, and he, he kind of divides his art into two factions there's like his his political statements that he has to do mm -hmm. and then there are things that aren't so political that he says may or may not sell better yeah um, but and i don't like that like i know that he used the word political and i right. we, but I, I think that it's unfair to his work um because right. it's 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 a they're all personal statements right, right. Um, yeah. yeah but i mean that's how he he described them but my favorite um is is titled and it's it's written right there on the on the um, painting it's mm -hmm. mr c.o jones which if you read it as a word, it's cojones. And if you know your Spanish at all, you know what cojones means. And it's a depiction. What does it mean, Terry? Balls. Really? Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. See, I think we're still allowed to say balls. On I think so. YouTube, yeah. I don't know. But the, the painting is a, is a depiction of Perseus cutting the head of Medusa. And in this case, Medusa has the face of Castro. Mm -hmm. And the tentacles that are coming out of uh, Medusa's head actually all have eyes in them which, which symbolize the all-seeing regime um, and it's, it's such a striking striking um, painting it's actually been purchased by one of his longtime clients mm -hmm. um, but it's kept in um, Carlos's studio because the client said I don't think my wife would want this hanging in our living room so just use it for your exhibits and, and keep it here and keep it safe and, and his wife um, is, is pretty amazing too, Claudia. And I think she summed everything up. We were having a conversation after we had this amazing tour of his studio and he was talking about all of his art and they were telling us their personal story. And she said, you know, when they came here uh, to America, they started getting invited to a friend's house for Thanksgiving. And Claudia was like, I didn't get it. Like this thank the concept of Thanksgiving is such an American thing. She's like, it, it made no sense to me. And she said, until like, I think it was maybe three years I was here and I was having Thanksgiving and I said, I said to, you know, um, Carlos, I'm like, I, I get it now. We're pig pilgrims also. We came to America searching for freedom just like the, the pilgrims did. And, and it just, it kind of summed up what we're trying to show mm -hmm. with, this, with this film. So now Claudia has to tell that story on, on film. So like, um, uh, Logan, you have a new book and uh, we are going to feature it on the episode after this one airs. But I'm, I'm thinking back to something Terry said that I, I think is, is one of the ways we can connect with young people who may be flirting with so-called democratic socialism 
it's that this top-down system, however, however you want to brand it, it's some form of authoritarianism that goes after the creative types and the artists and the people that deviate from the norm first. It's um, that sh- that should open some eyes, shouldn't it? I would hope so. I mean, you see these memes going around that are like. Oh, if only we got rid of, you know, work, if we got rid of capitalism and got rid of jobs, we could just sit around and create poetry all day and things like that. But it's actually the exact opposite of that. It's the, the art is it requires freedom in order to make art, in order to be creative, in order to do these things. You can't express yourself in a society that demands that you all conform and be like each other. And that's, you know, an economic freedom as well as a personal freedom. And I think it's really important. And so I'm hoping we can start to connect some of those dots for people and show them that it's not about working in a cubicle. It's uh, that's not what capitalism is. It's it's a it's an atmosphere in which you can do what you want to do and experiment and try new things. And I think we're living in such an artistically diverse time like people are really creative and coming up with great things and they love to be able to do that and they're not able to see the connection between their economic freedom and that and i think that's what we have to show people carlos has a such, such a powerful way of summing up all of his art and correct me if i get this wrong but he's like um, you must choose freedom mm-hmm. it yeah. just doesn't happen you have to make that commitment to it and and feeding off of, of that comment um it's actually why we're making this film um, you know, we, we meet a lot of second and third generation of immigrants from Latin America that have, you know, fled these horrific regimes. And, and these are kids that are like flirting with socialism now. I mean, I was talking to one kid, his grandfather had fled Cuba, and he actually said that um, the, the re- you don't tax people to pay for government programs, you tax, pe- you tax the rich to make life more equitable. And so these these generations are forgetting why their grandparents and parents left their lives, left everything behind to come here searching for freedom, and that's so important. And that's that's really why we're making the we're making the film. And again, just uh, an emotionally compelling story that's going to be completely independent of politics, mm-hmm. completely independent of Republicans versus Democrats. Um, I'm probably not going to be allowed to quote Bastiat in this film, no. but it'll work. I, I don't. So. I don't believe anyone will be quoting much of anything. Yeah. The well, the other thing that's going to be impressive is his work is all. Um, his work is all large. It, it's, it's big. Pretty big, and he works in multiple different mediums. So. I yeah, I mean, he, he does exciting. paintings. He does textiles. Um, textiles. He he has he has pottery that yep. is made in a very specific village like in in Mexico. Mexico yeah. Um, and then he did he did um, was little tiles that you put together mosaics mosaics that's mm-hmm. a very cool. They're, the, I think the, they're called the, the little the, tiles. The little, little tiles, tiles that you yeah. put together in mosaics. That was a really, really cool cool piece to see. And Terry has also engineered a very cool conversation with Yotil. Yotwell. Yotwell. Oh, we'll, we'll fix that in post. <laughs> Yotwell. And I actually, um, um, during the big uh, protests in Cuba this past summer, I had our friend Martha Bueno on, who is also a Miami liberty-loving Latino and and she was talking about the power of of the song that Yo Teal Twelve, wow, dude. Fuck. <laughs> Fucking A. <laughs> We're just gonna ta- this too, by the way. But, uh, so the, the good news, it's it's, it's Yo Twelve. So, save me here. Like you, you, I think 12. you know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> I have no idea where you're going. <laughs> He's trying to say that they made the music video. It's a big deal. Right. Helped Cuban so, revolution that was yeah. going on. So, to <laughs> so answer my question. <laughs> there wasn't going to be a question. <laughs> he just so, wants so, to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Yo-12 is part of a, of, a, of, a, of a group of Cuban musicians that uh, produced this film, this film, this Petri- song. Petria y Vida. Petri- Petria y Vida. Hopefully uh, I said that right. You did. I don't know. Um, so... Which is a takeoff of, um, so that's country or life, or yeah. the traditional way was country or death. And so he changed it and did the this. The communist bastard the, way of saying it. Yes. So he changed it and this, this song became like this huge rallying cry for, for people there in, in Cuba. There were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people protesting all over Cuba. And, and this song sparked it all. I think two of the people that are in Cuba are either missing or in jail at the moment. That's what um, Carlos said. Yeah, yeah the, 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 uh, what do you call a hip hop group? I, is it a band? Is it a group? A bunch anyway, of guys. Anyway, two members of the group who actually lived in Cuba have now been disappeared. 
which gets back to the point that I was trying to make, which is um, authoritarians hate creative people because creative people don't think, they don't fall in line, they don't um, uh, do the things that the dictators want them to do, and then they get disappeared. Right. But like you, you can't stop. I mean, the song is everywhere. They they just want a Grammy. And yeah, we're, we're doing this really cool interview with him. Uh, we'll be at the Atlas Network uh, Freedom Celebration. It's not the exact Freedom term. Dinner. Freedom Dinner. And and he is performing his, his song. And so we put together an interview uh, between Yo Twelve and our good friend Antonella Marty, who um, is also with Atlas Network. Uh, Yo Twelve doesn't speak English, so it's going to be a conversation um, in Spanish. With well, Antonella I, I will and master 12, Spanish so. before next week. Because you, you see, you know that's you Tuesday see how night. natural it you have, rolls off my tongue. Mm -hmm. That's you have four days. <laughs> he can already pronounce his name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that's cool, and and you know we always sort of aspired to. Um, get in into cultural space and and get away from just economics. I'm I, I sort of learned the hard way that most normal people don't think about things in terms of supply and demand and and disincentives and and all the things that I was taught. Um, but if you know music, film, storytelling, um, empathy with an individual, like these are all things that are universal. And so that that's always been part of Free the People's mission, and and you guys are actually getting pretty good at it. Thanks. <laughs> Don't jinx it. <laughs> All right. So, so now I'm going to turn the tables and actually ask you a question. Okay. So, what did the team do this year that you're most proud of, or what did you do that you're most proud of? What did I do that I was most proud of? Um, so, I am proud of the fact that that I was. Um, maybe first amongst equals in obsessing, uh, Logan's going to immediately dispute this, uh, <laughs> obs obsessing about about mm -hmm. the authori authoritarian direction that lockdowns would take. And, and I'm proud of the entire arc of our work since March of 2020 because we didn't pull any punches, but we've also tried to figure out ways, like all we have, to tell that story in a way that would be compelling to people that don't think about unintended consequences of, of economics. And, and we're now, um, I don't know if this is the proudest thing that I'm doing, but we've had some really intense conversations about supply chains. I mean, who doesn't want to talk about that? that that's recently released. Um, but it, it, it's funny because people, the, the really smart people that locked us down actually imagined that there was a switch on the wall of the global economy that they could turn off and everyone in their nomenclature, um, they, they would tell everyone to stay the fuck home. And when everything was safe again, they would just flip the switch and everything would be back to normal. Well, here we are at Christmas time and, and people are sort of learning the hard way that, that a complex economy is not something that can be dictated from the top down. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting. We were on vacation. It's like the first real vacation that we've taken in a, in a long, long time. I and mean, we tack on days here and there when we're traveling for business. But we took a week to go down to the Caribbean. And it was, uh, we were there like the week of March 17th when they were, the world was shutting down. And we were, you know, monitoring our flights because we were worried that we were going to get home. And somebody was like, well, you know, we're sitting here on the beach drinking a cocktail. It's not the worst place to get stuck. And then, and I'm not even an economist, but I said, yeah, but remember, we're at the end of the supply chain. And I didn't realize, like, how telling those words were. And, like, you started obsessing about it. And it's, it's amazing how it affects everything. Um, Free the People is a foundation. We're a nonprofit. We were just working on our end of mail um, fundraising appeal, which is a big letter that we send out. And we were working on this the day that we released this um, Let's Talk About Supply Chain. And so we're releasing the doc this, this film and I'm working on the letter and I'm talking to our printer to discover that um, they don't have paper, mm -hmm. that the supply chain has, has messed up paper. So our, the delivery of our letter is going to be delayed. We're hoping that people get it by the end of the year, but we don't even know. Um, but it was just a very um, ironic sense of timing for that. But I think that's something to be justifiably proud of, Kibby, because a lot of people who ought to know better kind of gave into the fear at the beginning of this and thought, well, this is different. This, we don't need to worry about freedom now. We just need to worry about safety. Mm -hmm. And I'm really pleased that we were all on the same page about that and were able to stand up against this right from the beginning 
and didn't go through an embarrassing period where we're like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Because we knew yeah. it wasn't okay. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I, I am always a short-term pessimist, and Terry knows how pessimistic I've been the last two years. Um, slightly grumpy, even perhaps. Slightly. Um, but I'm also a long-term optimist, and I've been I've been talking about this this counter-revolution. Because I remember the last time everybody fell in line and, and walked off the cliff um, for a tragically stupid government policy, the Wall Street bailouts in 2008. And there was a counter-revolution that, that sought to, to right that. I, I think this one's broader and, and ultimately it's, it's probably less about economics and more about just basic human liberties. Um, the right to speak, the right to leave your house, the right to not be forcibly injected with something that you've decided for whatever reason is not for you. And and to me, that that coalition is is a little bit like what we thought free the people might be in the first place. It was sort of above partisan politics. Mm-hmm. It was based on values and, and things that we humans could relate to each other on. It was kind of ecumenical. So I I think that in our little way, we're, we're trying to to help nudge that along. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I'll take all the credit when it happens. <laughs> no, you won't. I'm Did gonna it? give um, Logan gets all the credit. Okay. Hooray! <laughs> I just wanted to plug one of one of, uh, of our other shows that goes along with what you're talking about, called "Leaving the Left for Liberty," mm-hmm. um, and that's kind of I think another big part of what we're trying to do is is create this community of politically homeless, which is you know. Um, phrase you've used before um but yeah leaving left for liberty is it's in the title but um it's people that have left the left especially during this time or maybe because of cancel culture or mandates or just how insane the left has become and i think that's what we want to do here just create a create a little community and crucially it's not people who have left the left for the right People right. Right. up the left for something independent and different, free thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have a, a, a new friend, um, Robert. Um, um, he's. It's an interesting story. He's an Israel. He's a professional basketball player in, in Israel, and when all of these lockdowns happened, he was like, "This isn't right. Like, this doesn't make sense. The government shouldn't be able to do this." And he started um, this Google Internet thing. is is an amazing. Um, thing he started researching and he found Hayek and Mises and, and Bastiat and uh, found an organization called Mont Pelerin Society and through that we connected with him and we, we just spent um, four days with him in Guatemala at Mont Pelerin and and it's a it was like a really great like beacon of hope because like if he figured out like if we know this one guy that figured it out um, then there are so many more people like him out there and it's it's really kind of awesome yeah I mean, and this this gets to something we've always talked about is just like the democratization of knowledge and your ability, despite the censors and despite all of the barriers that that our overlords want to impose on us, you can go find stuff, mm-hmm. you can educate yourself, you can think it through for yourself, and and our ideas. We're not going to tell anyone what to think, but if here's here's a different way of thinking about things, mm-hmm. and if that turns you on, and going back to to Sam's point. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to Sienna May Heath, who is the, the star of Leaving the Left for Liberty. And I love the story about how we met her, or how she found us, um, because she found our content somehow. And I'm, I'm going to ask her this. I, wanna, I want her to tell the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but she found our stuff somehow. And during the lockdowns, we had those... those uh, week- Liberty Pubs. Liberty Pubs, weekly happy hours. Are we going to do one this Christmas? I don't know. Should we do? We were thinking about doing a special Christmas edition. Like, uh, look at Matt's <laughs> face. He's like, no. Oh, come on. It's like an hour it's next a, it's week. It's a bad time to ask them. They, they I might, know. They might be slightly yeah. hungover. Ask us uh, next week. Okay. Yeah. But, ask us after we're done shooting. Next but anyway, so Sienna. No, not next week. Before. It's the week after. It's like the week right before Christmas. It's an hour okay. out of your day. <laughs> you can relax. Um, so anyway, like I was saying. <laughs> Were you um, talking? S- yeah. Sienna found us, and she joined our little virtual family, mm-hmm. and we started having conversations. And and she, in one, one of those Liberty pubs, she ended up telling her story, and and all of us. I, I don't know. I don't actually remember. Maybe it was your idea, Sam. I was like that. That would be cool mm-hmm. to document that a little bit. And it started off with a documentary called Real Unity. Real Unity. That's yeah. Right. So so Real Unity um, competed at Anthem this year. 
and and to me it's it was it was a, a cool experiment and a and a very different style of filmmaking and she's she's kind of a I would call her a beat poet but I'm not sure that's what she is but she writes she 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 writes beautifully mm-hmm. in in very vivid and descriptive ways and and um, she's um, she's now hosting a series yeah the the series that you mentioned earlier called Leaving the Left for Liberty. Mm-hmm. So it's it's another cool experiment and and again one of our aspirations for for reaching and engaging audiences very much outside of our our liberty bubble whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and by the way, I'm if there's anyone watching this or listening to this podcast that's a creative, I think one of our original visions for Free the People was to make it a creative hub where it's not just us making the content, but we're actually outsourcing content or finding other people that are in the space um, that can kind of make creative content uh, under our, sorry, I'm using the word content too much. You hate that. Um, work. Creative work. work. Creative work. Well, right. let's, let's under our umbrella. Nice so. stuff. Let's crowdsource a better word than content yeah. <laughs> for the cool shit that we do. Yeah. Cool shit's better than Yeah, content. cool shit. Just all right, so we're going to rewrite all of our proposals just and shit. just do like a search and replace mm-hmm. for c- content to cool shit. I don't know. We'll raise billions. I don't, yeah, of I don't have a better word, but I just, it seems so to me. I never put the word content in proposals when I'm I writing know, them out. Because you so know it. I, I listen me. to you. you know, <laughs> I take your opinion seriously. Okay, Thank you. <laughs> we're, there's a podcast. That we're, 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 having, we're on a podcast right now. <laughs> this isn't just we're a private conversation. We're actually going to run Elevator Muzak <laughs> while there's, they're, they're squabbling during um, this. But, uh, so, so I well, think it's time I think to wrap this up. I feel like we need to kill this before <laughs> yeah. the very last person watching leaves. <laughs> so. Sam Thanks. wants to impose some kind of professionalism onto us. It's crazy. So uh, um, let's... Snaps the fun out of it. Let's he just l- wants everything to be content. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to bring this around. Um, so anyway, we survived another year. It was a beautiful year for all of the problems. Um, it's, not we, wood. it's not over yet, dude. Yeah. Such a pessimist. Um, but as you can tell from, from all of the holiday stuff, we, we love the There's holidays just here. Tree, There's just one see. tree here. It's a live um, one. There you can't see it, but behind us is an army of <laughs> nutcrackers. They freak me out because if they ever come to life, You're done. it's over. It's over. Only if Tchaikovsky starts playing, then that's when you really have to worry. Although one of them's got a champagne bottle, so he True. can't be all bad. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and thank you for putting up with the show. <laughs> that was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people. Mm-hmm.